Dr. Margarian will be delivering the first speech. She studied modern European history in the uh, University of Europe, and she uh, delivered lectures in many universities. And at the moment, she is the director of the Armenian Women's Association, uh, Armenian Women's Archives of the Armenian International Women's Association. Her speech will be on uh, one in the early 20th century, perspectives from the Army American mission. Each speaker will have 20 minutes, and then you can ask your questions. We will be answering them. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I've done work on the American missionaries in the Ottoman Empire, especially in the early period. But this is the first time I've worked on Vaughn. And so I learned an awful lot from the interesting uh, program yesterday, and I'm sure that I'm going to be learning a lot today as well. So I want to thank the Dink Foundation for making these conferences possible and also for all the wonderful work they do in order to increase peace and understanding in this world, which we badly need. So the American missionary Ernest Yarrow <clears throat> once described Vaughn as the most undeveloped yet the most promising of the American stations in Turkey. My paper looks at the American missionary station in Vaughn during the first decade or so of the 20th century, its role in the Armenian community, and also to see any light it can shed on the rapidly changing social, economic, and political conditions that led to the catastrophe unleashed by World War I. So it took the Americans a while to reach Vaughn. <clears throat> Entering the Middle East in their ambitious goal to Christianize the nations, they arrived in Smyrna in 1820, Constantinople, Istanbul, in 1830, and finding their most encouraging prospects among the Armenians, they moved on to the Armenian populated centers in Erzurum, 1839, Marash, 1845, and Harpet, 1855. The large concentration of Armenians in Vaughan made it a prime location, but it's the general lawlessness in the area, <clears throat> combined with its geographical inaccessibility, made its occupation difficult. So it was not until 1872 that Dr. George C. Reynolds <clears throat> and his wife Martha found their way to Vaughan to open a station. They actually remained in Vaughan except for occasional furloughs in Europe and America until 1915. <clears throat> That's 42 years, an amazing time, I think. So if we look at Vaughn in 1900, we find that it's still showing the effects of the 1896 massacres, which took place then in Vaughn in June 1896. And so we have... Uh, Armenian community that's paid a heavy toll, aside from countless deaths, it left a poor, starving, homeless, and depressed Armenian community. Over the next several years, the chief preoccupation of the Americans was to supply relief for the victims, especially the orphans. So in 1900, we find Dr. Reynolds contributing, <coughs> distributing relief all over the area, keeping up religious services in two churches four miles apart, providing medical care three afternoons a week, and superintending an orphanage with 500 children, day schools with 400 pupils, besides the administrative work for the station. And I have a slide I can't So here we have a map of the city of Vaughan. You can see the um, old city to the left, the gardens to the right, where 
the Armenians, of course, worked in the bazaar in the old city and uh, lived mainly in the gardens. And if you can see number 12, that's the American mission, and the foreign consulates are in the same area. <coughs> And the other picture shows you the main street in Vaughan, leading from the walled city to the gardens. Now, it was obviously impossible for one couple to keep up this work schedule. And so the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which was headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts, and was the first and largest American organization working in the Ottoman Empire, assigned the medical doctor Clarence Usher to Vaughan in 1900, and in 1904 sent out a new couple, Ernest Yarrow and his wife Jane. <clears throat> there was also in Harpeth a German mission, which you'll hear about next, and a French uh, Dominican monastery. Now, the emphasis of the Americans during the, the years in providing relief and social services, that is education and uh, medicine, show how far the American board had come from its earliest emphasis on converting the people of the Middle East to its brand of evangelical Christianity. Now it was focusing on improving lives, which they call the social gospel, that is living a Christian life. <clears throat> Now, the American missionary's failure to enact change in the Armenian church and the rather tepid response to the Armenian Protestant church that they had established contrasted sharply with the American success, on the other hand, with their educational and other programs and their publications in the vernacular Armenian language, or Ashkarapat. It can be argued that, in fact, the successes that they registered in education and publications helped to foster the Armenian awakening and the rise of nationalism, the Zartung. But on the other hand, this movement aroused perversely opposition to the Americans as representing an unwanted foreign influence and therefore negatively affected their work. So some of their short-term gains actually worked against them. In the long run, and all of these trends seem to have magnified in Bonn. So the Protestant church had been established in Bonn prior to 1900, and in 1904, Dr. Reynolds <clears throat> had been able to erect in the gardens an impressive church edifice. I'm sorry, I thought I had a picture of it, but I couldn't find it, but it's a very New England Protestant-looking church. It really looks out of, out of place in Bonn, but there it was. It was fairly impressive. It could seat 1,000 people easily, and they could fit 13, 1,400 people in it. But uh, not only was Dr. Reynolds unable to increase the number of church members, he actually faced large desertions. Uh, in 1907, he reported that since the beginnings, the Garden Church had attracted only 199 members, and none at all had joined in the past two years. Several of his church members argued that the existence of a separate Protestant church was a hindrance to the acceptance of evangelical ideas because these ideas were seen as foreign. Uh, if the Protestant church did not exist, these evangelical ideas would more easily permeate the Armenian church, they argued. And the Bond missionaries were sympathetic to this point of view. Yarrow wrote in 1908, I can see the almost hopeless condition of the Armenian Gregorian Church and the great lack of spirituality. But something within me says an effort ought to be made to build it from within. So the missionaries therefore did all they could to encourage cooperation between their church and the um, Armenian <coughs> Gregorian Church. For example, Arsen Vartabed, who was described as the locum tenens of the Yatama Catholica say, came to visit the orphanage regularly, and one time he said, you know, we send these boys out into the world at age 16. It's a pity we can't give them a little more education. So Reynolds immediately suggested, why don't we get together 
and jointly offer some kind of additional education for the boys. Surprisingly, Arsene Vaktabet agreed. <clears throat> he appointed six people to a committee to meet with the missionaries and to develop a plan for a joint educational program. But when the committee met for six months, developed a plan, presented it to Arsene Vaktabet, he just abruptly rejected it, and that was the end of that. But despite the uh, reluctance of the Van Armenians to formally join the Protestant church, attendance at their services were good. This was attributed by the missionaries to the fact that the people liked to hear Asharapad when they went to church. They liked to hear the Bible, especially the Bible stories in Asharapad, and also attraction to their music. So at the Gardens Church for much of this period, Sunday services drew an average of 1,300 people. Sunday school attracted over another 1,000, and the prayer meetings were popular. In addition to the two churches in Bonn, the American-sponsored uh, evangelists and elementary schools in a number of rural areas, <clears throat> such as in 1907, Haigatsor, Aradens, Garjan, Akhtamar, Nareg, Unzak, Palu, Aradens, Hudustan, Mashkudag, Avans, and Agyans. Now, I have a section here on health that I'm going to skip. I don't have time for but I think Dr. Usher really had a wide reputation, and they had a quite impressive medical system. And I also have a section about travel, how difficult it was for the missionaries to get to Vaughn, how difficult it was to get to Vaughn in those days. But I have to skip that one also, moving ahead. So looking at the local conditions, the Americans had to be careful. They were, after all, allowed to live and work in Turkey at the sufferance of the Ottoman government. They had to be careful in their reports. They weren't sure that their communication was secure. But if, if we do read their reports during this period, there are two major themes. The first one is the depressed economic conditions that they attributed to poor government. They particularly cited the tax system, which they thought was absolutely ridiculous. It was so excessive that it destroyed the productive capacity of the people. They didn't understand it. It was illogical because people were taxed to their last possessions and if you destroy the productive ability of the people, uh, the next year you don't collect your taxes. They couldn't understand it. And finally, Reynolds concluded the clear policy of the government is to get rid of the Armenian question by getting rid of the Armenians. So the second theme that you find throughout these, this period are the disturbed ethnic conditions. There are just continually incidents um, going on through the whole period, many of them caused by the roving bands of revolutionaries. There weren't that many of them, but they were very effective, many of them from Russia. And um, they, the, uh, there would be these violent confrontations between the revolutionaries, mostly Tashnags at, at this time and period, and the government. A small band of, of revolutionaries would elicit a massive reaction from the government. And I discuss in my paper in particular two incidents. One was in 1904 when there were massacres in the Sassoon and Mush region. As supposedly thousands were killed. And the U.S. consul in Norton, a Norton who was in Harpet, uh, received orders that he should just go to Mush and see what was going on. So he went to Mush where things had quieted down, but he heard that the revolutionaries had moved down to Vaughn. So he went to Vaughn. Um, he, along with Dr. Usher and the English consul, met with the revolutionaries and somehow they engineered a truce. Um, so um, um, Norton left Vaughn saying that he had left it tranquil, 
but it was the tranquility of a dormant volcano. And sure enough, you know, the truce only lasted a month, and there were continued outbreaks in Aftamar and, and elsewhere. The second incident that I discuss in more detail is the one in the famous one in Armenian folklore, um, <clears throat> the revolutionary Davo, who had a, a disagreement with the Tashnag leadership and decided to get his vengeance by going to the government and telling them where all the um, arms and ammunition had been hidden. So at that point, of course, the government began this massive um, investigation. And over the first several months of 1908, it was chaos in Bonn. Business came to a standstill. No one knew what was going to happen next. And um, by the time things were pacified, the missionaries reported that only 50 to 100 Armenians had been killed. But um, the um, interesting part of that is that because they were so wound up with this aftermath of the Davo incident, that they almost didn't notice the revolution that took place in July in Van. And it really wasn't until September, until it, it kind of hit home, um, the missionaries um, had postponed their boys' school graduation. The school graduations were big events in those days. In addition to parents, they would invite all the local officials. And so this, the postponed um, event, which took place in September, uh, was very well attended, especially by the local uh, officials. And so they had a reception afterwards, uh, including not only the governor, but also representatives from the CUP, the um, uh, Young Turks. Uh, a delegation had just arrived from Istanbul. One of its members, a certain Hejib Bey, gave a speech asserting the usual line. In this land, two brothers had been living at enmity with one another, the result being oppression and wrong and suffering. But now they had come to regard each other as friends, and thus a new era was dawning for the land. But the most uh, outstanding and extraordinary thing for the missionaries was to see two leaders of the local Tashnag party in easy conversation with these government and CUP officials. One of these was Armin Manugyan, who had been jailed in prison by the government only three or four months earlier. Uh, now he had been pardoned along with the general amnesty that came along with the Constitution. And here was this man who had been jailed a few months later in very friendly conversation with all these uh, <coughs> government leaders. And in fact, Aram also made a speech saying, you know, what you might expect him to say. <clears throat> First of all, he urged the Americans to expand their efforts, not only to serve the Armenians, but also the Kurds and the other people, which was really unnecessary because the missionaries wanted to work with the Muslims. It's just that the Muslims did not attend their schools. <clears throat> And he also expressed the hope that before long, the Armenians themselves would so completely come into their own as to make further foreign help unnecessary. And I guess I should, um, these, okay, thank you. Um, these are just some scenes, some missionary photographs of Lake Van and the boats that they had, the fishing boats below and sailboat above. And these are the missionaries in Van. Um, uh, taken in 1911. <clears throat> so the new regime proved to be a mixed blessing for the Americans because on the one hand, they could enjoy new freedoms, such as the removal of censorship, but they faced new challenges in the form of a hostile um, Tashnag Tsuchun, which now operated openly, consolidated its efforts to control the Armenian community, enjoyed the right to bear arms, and was stronger due to its close partnership with the ruling CUP party. Um, 
the missionaries continue to focus on the schools, and I'm sorry I can't talk more about the education, but they had expanded their schools and upgraded them over the period. The girls' schools were under the care of the Women's Board of Missions, and they had two female missionaries who were there throughout all these years. One of them is shown there in the middle row on the right. <clears throat> Um, but, of course, during this period, also the native schools were expanding, and so you have a competition going on between the native Armenian schools and the missionary schools. Um, the missionaries felt that they had first place as far as education was concerned. Yarrow wrote that the Turks and Armenians are putting a great deal of strength into their school system, especially the latter, that is the Armenians. But unfortunately, their institutions are almost always, without exception, either non-religious or else actively atheistic. He asserted that almost all of this enthusiasm for learning has its source in the American board schools, and argued that mission schools had to keep up the work to keep their leadership in this field. And in fact, they did take steps in that direction. In April 1913, the American Board finally agreed to the capstone of the educational system that the missionaries had been asking for since 1905, and that was the elevation of the boys' school with its 11 grades into a college. Their dream was to have a college in Vaughan, Construction was started on the college building as well as on a new girls' school building. The college was expected to draw students from a large area encompassing the three provinces of Vaughan, Bitlis, and Erzurum. As the new college buildings were being constructed, a freshman class of five boys was inaugurated in the fall of 1914, right at the outbreak of World War I. And um, I'm sorry, um, the bottom picture, and I'm sorry, somehow the t back row got cut off, but this is the faculty of the boys' high school and college in 1914, above a view of the hospital in Vaughan. As far as we can tell, the missionaries were looking ahead with great enthusiasm. And they had no idea, no inclination as as much as we can tell from, from what we have, of the events that were coming that were going to drive them away, destroy not only the American premises but the entire city and put an end to the Armenian presence in that part of the world. Thank you. <clears throat>